Proverbs 15, verses 1 to 17 this morning. Um, so I don't have a copy of the church Bible here. Uh, what page? Uh, page 1006. 1006, page 1006. We're using the, the Bibles provided here in the church. Good to hear voices. We were singing that song, and there was no music. There was no music, and it was just, just the, just the singing. I turned my ear, I turned my head, and I could hear voices. And I don't know if you're supposed to be singing, but it was good to hear. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, living in the presence of God today. Uh, let's pray to first, and then we'll look at this uh, scripture together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. But I love studying your word. I love um, seeing what you've, you've said and, and understanding it. But you have to remind me every once in a while that uh, it's, it's not just a matter of studying and understanding your word, but What you do in your word is you, you, you bring us to meet with you. You bring us to, to see Jesus. And so I ask this morning that uh, as, we, as we look into, into the scripture and as we gain an understanding of what it says, that uh, ultimately at the end of the day, what you'll do in each of our hearts is that you'll help us to see Jesus better that we'll have that we'll have a real meeting with him. That, Lord, uh, you would uh, indeed meet with us in your word and change our lives because that's what you do. You reach down into the very core of who we are and you transform us from the inside out. Thank you for the work that you do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the things I've uh, tried to do as I've studied through Proverbs is to interpret it contextually. Uh, Proverbs are made up of all these little sayings, individual sayings, and you could really take many of these sayings and you can plop them into various different circumstances and they would apply. But I think that Solomon has arranged his material in a, in a way with a particular design and purpose so that as we read the Proverbs in context, we begin to learn some important wisdom for navigating specific issues and circumstances in life. And so that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to understand what Solomon is saying within the context of the verses uh, that uh, he's, he's put his uh, sayings into. The, scriptures, the scripture we're looking at today is Proverbs 15, verses 1 to 17. And so what happens when we zoom out of this passage a little bit? We, what we see is that this this passage is part of a larger section that goes from Proverbs 15, verse 1, all the way through chapter 16 and verse 9. And one of the features of this section is how often God is mentioned. The name of the Lord comes up 17 times in these 42 verses, and it's the greatest concentration of God's sayings in the book of Proverbs. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And then when we zoom out from that another level, we see that this section that focuses on God is surrounded by verses that focus on the king. And so last time when we were in Proverbs chapter 14, the verses just before this in uh, chapter 14, verses 28 through uh, 35, we saw some of the uh, expectations for a wise king, that this wise king is not to lift himself above others, a leader is not to lift himself above others, and he is not to turn aside from righteousness. And then if you go down to Proverbs chapter 16, verses 10 to 15, at the end of this section, this big section, the verses after it also talk a lot about the king. And so I thought, why is the text arranged like this? Why all this concentration of God's sayings surrounded by two passages that talk about the king? And I think one of the things Solomon is doing here is he's, he's reminding us that there is a greater authority in our lives than the king. 
And so first of all, it's a reminder to the king or to any other leader that there is someone higher than you that you have to answer to. One of the temptations of your leader is to think, you know what? I'm the boss. I'm the one in authority. I'm the, I'm the one on top. And I don't have to answer to anybody. And God says, yes, yes, you do. There is someone you have to answer to. You have to answer to the Lord. But I think it's also saying to, um, to all of us that our ultimate loyalty is to God. Our ultimate loyalty is not to, to kings and presidents. It's not to CEOs and professors. Our ultimate loyalty is not to pastors or, or parents even. Our ultimate loyalty is to the king of kings, to the Lord of lords. We're to honor, we're to respect, we're to submit to those who are in leadership over us, but the one whom we answer to above all else is Jesus Christ, the one who is above all. And so in this message, I want to see that all of our life is lived before this God who is king over us. Theologians sometimes refer to this with this with a Latin phrase, Coram Deo, C-O-R-A-M, Coram Deo, D-E-O. It means in the face of, in the presence of God. We live all of our life, Coram Deo. We live all of our life in the presence, in the face of of God. And in particular, in Proverbs 15, verses 1 to 17, Solomon tells us that this God who we live in, in, in the presence of, he sees and he knows everything about us, and especially he sees our words and he knows our heart. And so if you're, if you're in leadership, you need to know that there's a king above you. But whether, but whether you're a leader or you're not, we are all accountable to God, first of all, to this God who sees everything about us, this God who, who, who sees our words, and who, who knows our hearts, and we're to live to please him. So that's what we want to look at this morning. Uh, first of all, God sees our words, Proverbs 15, verses 1 to 10. I purposely didn't say God hears our words, certainly he does, but I said God sees our words because in verse 3 it says that the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. And I also, the other reason I said God sees our words is because he doesn't just hear what we say, but he sees the impact of our words on those around us. What kind of impact do our words have on, on those around us? Uh, fourth, uh, two things here. First, gentle words diffuse anger. That's the first impact. Gentle words diffuse anger. At the end of Proverbs 14, we read about a king and his servant in 14 verse 35. A king delights in a wise servant, and a shameful servant incurs his wrath. And in that situation between a king and a servant, Proverbs 15 verse 1 is a piece of wisdom that applies to both of them. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This says to a servant that, in, that a gentle answer may help to resolve the problem that ignited the king's wrath. And this says to the king that his words shouldn't be so harsh that it produces greater anger. Even in his fury, it's wise to keep his emotions and his words under control. Perhaps you've heard this saying, you know, speak truth to power. Solomon um, certainly knew a thing or two about power. And I think he would give his counsel like this. He would say, give a gentle response to power. It doesn't mean that we're weak, all right? We can have strong convictions and we can even have strong disagreements. But the substance and the style of our words can still be gentle. That's what he's telling us to, to, to do. He's, he's not saying, you know, be a weak, be a weak person. Um, he's not saying, you know, your, your, your views and, and opinions and, and, and perspective don't, aren't important. He's saying that we, in the style of our words and the substance of our words, we can still respond in a gentle way. 
We can speak the truth without being harsh. Harsh words only escalate tensions. How do you, how do you react in a heated situation? Well, we've all been in them, right? How do you react in a heated situation? Our words can either escalate or de-escalate the tension and the potentially damaging emotions. They can ignite conflict or they can promote peace. Proverbs 15 verse 2 goes on to say, the tongue of the wise adorns or uh, knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. That word adorn refers to something that is good and appropriate and fitting. And Solomon is saying that the wise speak in a way that shows the goodness of their, of their knowledge and makes it attractive. And in particular, when we connect it with verse 1, what he's saying is that when we speak gentle words, it makes our knowledge attractive. It makes our knowledge, it commends our knowledge, it adorns our, our knowledge. In other words, we don't beat people up with our knowledge. We don't beat them up with what we know. The foolish, on the other hand, pour out words without thought of how it might hurt or harm other people. Their words are neither controlled nor nor considered. Their harsh, foolish words gush out indiscriminately. So Solomon is saying to us, listen, we need to give thought to what we say, and our tongues need to be constrained by the love of Christ so that our words commend the truth, adorn the truth to those who hear. A second impact of our words is seen in verses 4 to 7. Four to seven. Healing words promote flourishing. We're going to skip over verse 3 for the moment. Go down to verse 4. It says, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. A soothing tongue is a healing tongue. Here it's identified with the eternal healing and the eternal flourishing of the tree of life. Okay, so we live in, a, in this broken world that, that waits for the restoration of God's design, God's original design for his creation. But as we wait, as we, as we live in the midst of the brokenness now, of this disrupted order that God had, had designed for this world, as we wait for it to be renewed and restored, we can still, right now, bring a measure of healing. We can, we can communicate in a way that points people to the hope that is in Jesus Christ. This hope that we're, we're waiting for the tree of life. But even now, our words can be healing words that point to that hope of what Christ what are some examples of, of healing words? One writer says, kind words, praise, encouragement, speaking the truth, repentance, heartfelt confession, prudent advice, genuine love and admiration communicated verbally. Those are some examples he gives of, of, of healing words. That reflect the tree of life, the hope that, that, that God gives to us, that restoration of his order for his creation. On the other hand, there are perverse words. Perverse words turn things upside down. So perverse words may come in the guise of healing. Right? They, they, may, they may appear to be truth, but they're mixed with lies. They may appear to be an apology, but it's not really sincere. Right? It's, it's, it's something that, that seems good, but is actually very twisted and upside down. They come in the guise of healing, but what they really do is, the, is they fracture 
and they break the spirit. Sticks and stones hurt our bodies, right? But words have the potential to hurt us even more deeply to the very core of our being, to our spirit, to break, to crush, to fracture our spirit. And so we want to have a healing tongue. How do we have a healing tongue? I want you to follow Solomon's logic with me, his train of thought here. Proverbs 15, verse 5 says, A fool spurns a parent's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. The words discipline and correction imply that we will experience some pain when, we are, when we're instructed in wisdom. When, when we learn wisdom, there's a measure of pain to that. None of us like to be confronted. None of us like to be rebuked. None of us like to have someone come up to us uh, to say, listen, here's something that's, that's wrong in your life. No, 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 I'm always right. We don't like to be challenged about the way we live, and, and we often get defensive, and sometimes we get angry. But the prudent, who take a long view of life, the prudent know the importance of discipline and correction, and so they heed instruction. They heed wise instruction, meaning that they guard it as something valuable, as something precious. They don't devalue it. They don't despise it. They take wisdom into their hearts, and they protect it. And this wisdom, if you go all the way back to Proverbs 3, verse 18, this wisdom is a tree of life to those who take hold of it. We heed instruction, we take it, and we protect it in our hearts because it is a tree of life to those who take hold of it. And so before you and I can have a healing tongue that is a tree of life to others, we need to have eaten from that tree ourselves. We need to have taken hold of that wisdom and stored it in our hearts first. To put it in New Testament terms, we need to have the abundant life of Christ in us through faith before we can speak words of abundant life to others. So what does verse 6 have to do with that? I think it's an analogy to further Solomon's point. It says, The house of the righteous contains great treasure, but the income of the wicked, the revenue of the wicked, brings ruin. So throughout Proverbs, we've seen this, this idea that when God blesses the righteous with material wealth, he doesn't just do it so that you get a lot of stuff. He blesses the, the righteous with material wealth with the expectation that that will be used to bless others. It's never just for us. It's, it's, it's always, it, and God gives you anything. All right? Yes, it's, it's, it, it blesses you, but you're to look at that and say, in what way can, can I be a blessing to others through this? And the implication of verse 6 is that the house of the righteous is a storehouse of treasure including crops and other goods, which can be shared with the community, especially those in need. The revenue of the wicked, however, the income of the wicked, however, will ultimately become their ruin because, as we see elsewhere in, in Proverbs, they hoard it for themselves. They, they have this treasure and, and they bring it into their house, but instead of it being a storehouse that blesses others, it becomes a hoard a place of hoarding all for themselves. And so instead of their income being a treasure, it brings trouble to themselves and to others. And so that picture Solomon writes, and it seems nothing to do with the context, but I think what he's doing here is he's giving us an illustration that we're supposed to store up wisdom in order to share its healing, just as a person stores up material wealth in order to bless others. 
Verse 5 said we're to guard wisdom as a precious treasure. When we do that, it's like a storehouse of wisdom in our hearts. And now verse 7 says that we're to share that wisdom generously with others. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, but the hearts of fools are not, are not upright. So you see that analogy with verse 6? Right? He's, he's saying, listen, um, just as the righteous are entrusted with material wealth to bless others, the wise are entrusted with a storehouse of wisdom to bless others. God gives you that tree of life so that you can spread that tree of life to people in your life. And we are to scatter it widely for the good of others. Unlike the fool who has neither the wisdom to share nor the desire to share and help others, we are to make God and his life-giving wisdom known. And in that way, we can have healing words that promote flourishing, that promote life. So gentle words, diffuse anger. Healing words promote flourishing. And now let's go back to verse 3. In between these two, these two sayings about how we should use our words and the impact they have on others, in between these two sayings, Solomon reminds us that we are accountable to God for what we say. Verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. Everywhere. I was visiting, when we were visiting our grand, granddaughter recently, um, I built a fort for her. So we, we you know, we take blankets and, and in, the, in, the, in the living room, we take all the couch um, cushions off and, and, uh, and we build a fort. And she goes into it and, and, she, and, and I'm on the outside and she says, there's a, there's a light there, you gotta cover that, that light. And so I go over there and, and and tuck it in a little bit and say, no, no, there's another light over here. And then when it's all dark inside, she says to me, okay, yeah, yeah. That's what she calls me. I want you to, I want you to, I want you to say to Nai Nai that autumn is not real. I want you to say to daddy, autumn is not real. And sometimes we think we can hide from God, right? If I, just, if I just hide somewhere, I'm not real to God. My sin is not real to God. He can't see, he doesn't know. We can't hide from God. There's no place to hide. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. There's nowhere that we can go, nothing that we can do, and God's penetrating gaze is not there. And the context makes us aware that God sees all that we say. Even when nobody else hears or sees, God is fully aware of our words. And he is not a passive observer. He judges he evaluates all that he says, all that he sees. It says here that he distinguishes between the wicked and the good. So it's not just, oh, whatever. He says, this is wicked, this is good. He sees and he evaluates. Our words are one key piece of evidence in his judgment. And when you go down to verses 8 to 10, we see his verdict. Verse 8, the Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. The Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. Stern discipline awaits anyone who leaves the path. The one who hates correction will die. Our words matter to God. 
You know, leaders especially need to realize that their power and position does not give them the right to say whatever they want without any thought of the consequences of their words. Nobody is exempt from the, from the watching eye of God. If we are wicked, God sees our ways. He sees our words. And it says here he detests it. It's an abomination to him. Recall in Proverbs that the wicked are those who disadvantage others for their own advantage. Right? In Proverbs, that's the, that's the idea of wickedness. The wicked disadvantage other people for their own advantage. And if we come to God like that, if we come to God like that with our sacrifices, offering thanks, offering praise, but without any repentance, without any brokenness for our sin, God is right not to accept our worship. How could a holy God not hate the hypocrisy and the self-righteousness of that kind of worship? In fact, what awaits the wicked is judgment. Right? You can't pretend to be godly before God. No matter how religious we are, those who spurn the discipline of wisdom Verse 5, those who spurn that discipline will be met with God's more severe discipline. Those who hate correction and refuse to forsake their way will face eternal death, separated from God. God will eventually bring the wicked to account. Nothing is hidden from him. It's all real to him. He sees it all, and he judges it all. But God's gaze also cuts the other way. Not just in, 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 in judgment of the, of the wicked. He sees the ways and the words of the righteous as well. The, the righteous, they're not good, they're not wise because of themselves. Righteousness is something that we receive when we hear the voice of God's wisdom calling us and we take hold of it by faith. It's, it's actually the voice of Christ calling us. Calling us to, uh, to, to, to hear, to, to, to repent, to, re to believe. Jesus is the, is the one who is perfectly righteous who took the condemnation of our wickedness by his death, so that through faith in him, we are given his righteousness. And so there's, there's, it's this gift that he gives to us. There's no place for us to, to, uh, to boast about it. We don't deserve it at all. But he gives to a, it to us as a gift. He clothes us with his righteousness when we turn to him in repentance. So there's no place for boasting in ourselves about this righteousness, but there is accountability for the gift. God gives you the gift of righteousness, you are accountable for it. We are to be upright and we are to pursue righteousness. We are to seek the advantage of others, even to our own disadvantage, right? The opposite of wickedness. We are to seek the advantage of others, even to our own disadvantage, because that is what God has made us to be. Because he has given to us and clothed us, clothed us with righteousness. We are to live that out in our lives. And when we do that, God sees and it pleases him pleases him. This is not the, 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 the most incredible thing in the world that God can be pleased with you. That in this world, you live your life and God is pleased. 
because of the righteousness of Jesus, because he's clothed you with his righteousness. He hears our prayers. He doesn't always answer our prayers the way that we want, right? But he is pleased by them. Even when nobody else sees the good impact of our life and our words, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees. And so the omnipresence of God, the, the fact that he is everywhere, doesn't mean we're constantly afraid of his punishment if we mess up. It means for the believer that there's this greater sense of trust and rejoicing that our lives matter to the God who loves us. Our lives matter to him. He sees. And thus we continue to heed his correction and we make our needs known to him and we live to please him with our words and with our entire life. Because God sees, God sees our Not only, not only does God see our words, but he also knows our heart. He knows our heart. Proverbs 15, verse 11. Said, says, death and destruction lie open before the Lord. How much more to human hearts? Some translations of this verse use the, the Hebrew words for death and destruction, which are Sheol and Abaddon. They refer to the grave and hell, to the depths of the earth, to the place that is as far away from heaven as you can possibly get. And yet, even this place of darkest darkness is open and transparent to God. The place that is the farthest, 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 farthest from heaven. Open to God. And if that's the case, then how much more does God know our hearts as we live our lives in full view of heaven and earth? Other people may not know our hearts, our motives, our desires, our thoughts, our drives. Other people may not know it, but God knows everything about us inside out. You can't see my heart. It's not real. No, it's very real to God. He knows. And in the following verses, Solomon talks about different kinds of hearts and how they manifest, manifest themselves, how they show themselves in life. And I really struggle to understand the big picture here. Solomon, what are you saying? Why did you put, why did you put these particular kinds of hearts in this passage that talks about our hearts being an open book to God? And so I went back and forth on this and... and uh, I had some different thoughts even last night and, and, and then changed them completely. Not totally, but... But I think his point is this. What is in our heart eventually gets revealed outwardly? What's in our heart eventually gets revealed outwardly? There's a connection between our inner life and our outer life. A nexus. It's, it's joined together. You, you can't disconnect it. What's on the inside eventually comes out on the outside. But as humans, we tend to focus on the outside. And so we look at appearance. We look at, we look at skills. We look at what's on the external. But God goes deeper. And he goes to the heart. He looks on the inside. It's not just our outward life that's laid out before God. Sure, that's laid out for everyone else, but it's our core, it's our heart that's laid open before God. So 
so let's look at some of these hearts. First, God knows the mocking heart. God knows the mocking heart that shows itself by its avoidance of the wise. Verse, um, verse 12, mockers, mockers resent correction, so they avoid the wise. The verse doesn't use the word heart, but the word resent is heart-related. It literally means the mocker does not love correction. And that's the real issue. There's no drive, there's no, there's no de desire in him for wisdom. The verse then moves from the inner affection, affection to the outward action. He does not go to the wise because on the inside, he has no desire, no drive for wisdom. He doesn't go to the wise to learn about life. He avoids those who could offer insightful criticism to better navigate life. His heart is set on his way, and that becomes evident in his rejection of God's way. We just see the answer, but God sees the heart. What's, what's the issue? The issue is that he has a heart that has no desire for wisdom. Second, God knows the troubled heart that shows itself in the countenance of the face. A happy heart, verse 13, a happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. You know, sometimes our heart is joyful and sometimes... Our heart is troubled. And you can see the difference in a person's face. Even in a day of wearing masks, you can see it in their eyes. You can see what's in their heart, on their face. The, fra the phrase makes the face cheerful means that a happy heart adorns the face, just like we saw how um, wise words adorn knowledge back in verse 2. A happy heart adorns the face, makes it attractive, makes it beautiful. We can pretend to be happy and put a smile on our face, but a person who is genuinely happy on the inside can't hide that happiness, it shows up in the face. You know that, right? There are times you can't, you can't wipe the smile off your face because there's that joy on the inside. Conversely, when your heart is filled with pain, it breaks your spirit and it drains your energy. And perhaps Solomon is talking about someone who has suffered injustice, who has suffered evil in their life. And although he doesn't say it, you can see the pain written on the face. But God, God doesn't just look at the outward demeanor. He knows your heart. And because he knows your heart, that's where he can minister. That's where he can touch. Because he knows your heart, you can look to him to bring healing to the inner person. To that very core of you that, that's, that's troubled and hurting. God doesn't just put a band-aid on. He knows your heart. That's what he wants to do with you. Third, God knows the discerning heart that shows itself by its hunger for the truth. Verse 14. The discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. Discernment is a quality of wisdom that manifests itself by its appetite. So the phrase, you are what you eat, could apply to, to the spiritual realm as much as it's used today in the, in the physical realm. But God doesn't just see, he doesn't just look at, he doesn't just know what we feed on. He goes deeper than, than that. He knows what you hunger for. 
He doesn't just see what you're eating spiritually. He, he sees what you desire, what you hunger for in your heart. A discerning heart seeks truth to grow in a deeper relationship with Christ. It has an appetite for what is spiritually healthy. In contrast, a fool feeds on folly. It, me it could mean that he likes to listen to himself. He just likes to, uh, just likes to listen to his own opinion. Talk, 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 yak, yak, yak. Or it could mean that he listens indiscriminately indiscriminately to others who merely reinforce his ideas and his opinions that he already has. It's an echo chamber, if you've heard that phrase. What we spend our time and our, en and our energy pursuing, whether wisdom or folly, that's important. But God goes further. He knows the spiritual condition of our heart and what we hunger for. Fourth, God knows the cheerful heart that shows itself by its contentment with its circumstances. Verse 15, all the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual fe feast. That, that word cheerful is literally good. It's a heart that is full of the goodness of God. And in that sense, it can also mean content. And Solomon says this kind of heart has a continual feast. What does he mean by that? Well, it doesn't mean that life is always easy. It doesn't mean that life is always full of abundance. The first part of the verse tells us that life is hard for many people that uh, uh, they are oppressed, the oppressed are afflicted, they are destitute, they are, their days are filled with trouble. And yet, even in the face of these evil circumstances, right, there, are those, there are those people who have a cheerful heart. There are those who have a heart that enables them to endure and to overcome the struggles and, and, and the pain of, of daily existence because their hearts are filled with the goodness of God. They still grieve, okay? Don't, don't misunderstand this. They still grieve, they still lament, they still understand and see the, the, the hardness of, of life. But they, are, they have also learned the sufficiency of Christ, that God is enough. And because they are content, whatever they have, it's like a feast. Instead of focusing on what they don't have, they see the goodness of God even in the midst of pain. Outwardly, there may, there may be not, there may be absolutely no reason for, for you to be content in your life, but God knows your heart. So trust Him. Trust Him, and He will minister to your heart. He will minister to your heart and transform you from the inside out to rise above your circumstances and to be satisfied in Christ and his, and his goodness. Mocking hearts, happy hearts, discerning hearts, cheerful hearts. Our hearts are exposed by the, by the resulting actions and demeanors of our life. What's on the inside gets revealed outwardly eventually. But before anybody else sees what's on the outside, God already knows what's on the inside. God already knows. And God doesn't just deal with us on the surface. He deals with us at the core. And who we are. No one else is like you. You and I have never had a desire, a thought, an intention, a motive that God doesn't know fully and completely. 
So how do we respond? How do we respond to a God like this, who knows everything about us, who sees everything about us? The passage ends with two better than sayings. What these do is they get us to think about what's important, think about what's valuable. Verse 16 and 17. Better, better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. So we've been talking about this, but, but just let this thinking sink into your heart for a moment that your heart is laid bare before the God of the universe. And then realize that this text does not tell you to run as fast as you can, as far away as you can from this God. When it says we're to fear the Lord, who knows us through and through, it means that he is graciously calling us to put him at the center of everything in our lives, every moment of our lives, all the time. This is what God is doing when he calls us to fear him. He is calling us to put him at the center of everything. This God who knows everything about us, and instead of running from him, he's saying, I want you to run to me, and I want you to, I want you to put me at the very center so that no matter what you do, wherever you go, whatever decisions you make in life, I'm right there, right there at the center in everything you do. Because, hey, guess what? I'm already, I already know. I already see. So come on, just put me right there at the center of your life. It means he is graciously calling us to live with him to, to trust him, to honor him, to, to adore him, to love him, to obey him from the heart because he alone is worthy of that kind of reverence. And he is telling us that this fear of the Lord is worth more, is worth more than anything else in the world. That if you only have a little, but you have the fear of the Lord, that is far better off than having the greatest treasure and the turmoil of a life without Christ in it. And so fear God. But God not only knows our hearts, he also sees our words. He sees the impact of our words on the people around us. So he says, pursue love. Speak gentle words and healing words in your family and in your church and in your workplace and in your, in your friendships, in all of your relationships. As verse 17 points out, love should be more important to us than luxury. Peace should be more important to us than prosperity. In modern imagery, we would say that sitting down for a meal of leftover craft dinner is better than a three... Uh, sitting down for a meal of leftover craft dinner with love is better than a, than a three-star Michelin meal surrounded by strife and animosity. Because God sees our words, we should prize loving and peaceful words above all the trappings of power and status. We live our lives in the presence of God. He sees everything. He knows everything. From the most powerful world leader to the lowliest servant, nothing is hidden from God. He sees, he knows, and that truth can devastate us. It can make us hide from God. Adam, Eve, where are you? It can drive us that way. The amazing message of the gospel 
is that the God who knows you, who knows every minute detail of your life, who knows you on the inside and the out, who knows every harsh word, every sinful thought that you have ever had, this God still loves us in Christ. That's the gospel. This God still loves us in Christ. And so he invites us to heed his correction and live. He invites us to pray and be heard. As one person has said, to be fully known and truly God, but truly loved. To be fully known and truly loved is that the love of God is love. It's a holy and transforming reality to realize that God knows everything about me and he loves me. And we love this God. And we love those who bring, whom he brings into our lives. Quorum. Let's pray together. Lord, there's, there's nothing you don't know about us. And honestly, we know the ways we fail you, the ways no one else knows how we sin, how we fail, how we fall. And sometimes, we even, we even hate ourselves the way we fail, the way we sin. So how, how, do we, how do we respond to a God who knows everything about us, every minute detail, and still loves us? Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Come on, be at the center of everything. Come. Help me. Help us to love, to love you with all of our being, and to love one another as you've loved us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.